Good morning. Lovely to be able to welcome you to uh, the service of worship this morning. Uh, it's good to come together. Uh, it's good to come together as God's people. Uh, and it's good to worship the Lord together. A few announcements before we begin. Uh, and just to say, Youth Fellowship is tonight, 7 p.m. Uh, in the Scott Rooms. Youth Fellowship this evening, 7 p.m. Uh, next Sunday evening, uh, we have... John's ordination service here, 7 p.m. in the church. Uh, we just really encourage you to come along to that. Uh, we'd love to see you. Uh, for John, just to feel supported in, in that. Uh, we do need some tray bakes uh, for people to bake some tray bakes for the supper afterwards uh, for that evening. So uh, if you're available to bake tray bakes, maybe just speak to Phyllis on that. Caramel squares, they're nice. So um, if you're available to do that, that would be a great help. Um, GB display is coming up Friday week, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, everybody welcome to that, 7 p.m. in the halls, Friday the 24th. Uh, a couple of PW events uh, on the announcement sheet there. Um, we have the Link Spring Breakfast on Saturday the 1st of April, 10 a.m. in Burt. Um, we also have the PW bus outing on Saturday the 27th to the Festival of Flowers in Lima Valley. Next week, next Sunday morning, uh, I am in Waterside and Fawn, uh, so Morris Ray is taking the service next Sunday morning. Um, also, we have an event there. I have wee flyers uh, just out in the, in the vestibule uh, for an event. It's a presbytery event called God, Google, and Generation Z. Uh, it's a series of seminars, mainly for parents, but for anybody involved with young people, could be grandparents, uh, youth workers, Sunday school leaders. And it's effectively just about keeping our young people safe online, on social media. Uh, if you're a bit like me, you sort of feel you don't really know what's going on sometimes with, with uh, how technology is advancing. So it's just about keeping our young people safe. 19th, 26th uh, of April and the 3rd of May, uh, Wednesday evenings in Rye Presbyterian. Well worth going to. That, I think, is all the announcements. We come to worship and we read in the book of 1 John. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. We stand to worship as we sing, The Lord's my shepherd, I will trust on you alone.
Ephesians chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 17, continuing our series looking at this book. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 17, page 243 of your Pew Bibles, New Testament section. This is God's Word. In the, Lord's, in the Lord's name, then, I warn you, do not continue to live like the heathen, whose thoughts are worthless and whose minds are in the dark. They have no part in the life that God gives, for they are completely ignorant and stubborn. They have lost all feeling of shame. They give themselves over to vice and do all sorts of indecent things without restraint. That was not what you learnt about Christ. You certainly heard about him, and as his followers you were taught the truth that is in Jesus. So get rid of your old self, which made you live as you used to, the old self that was been destroyed by its deceitful desires. Your hearts and minds must be made completely new. You must put on the new self, which is created in God's likeness and reveals itself in the true life that is upright and holy. No more lying then. Everyone must tell the truth to his fellow believer because we are all members together in the body of Christ. If you become angry, do not let your anger lead into sin and do not stay angry all day. Don't give the devil a chance. The man who used to rob must stop robbing and start working in order to earn an honest living for himself and to be able to help the poor. Do not use harmful words but only helpful words, the kind that build up and provide what is needed, so that what you say will do good to those who hear you. And do not make God's Holy Spirit sad, for the Spirit is God's mark of ownership on you, a guarantee that the day will come when God will set you free. Get rid of all bitterness, passion and anger, no more shouting or insults, no more hateful feelings of any sort. Instead, be kind and tender-hearted to one another and forgiving one another as God has forgiven you through Christ. We give thanks to God's word to us today. We come now to pray. Let us pray. Father, we come to you today reminding ourselves that you are the God who saves your word tells us that without your salvation, we are far from you. Without your grace, we are cut off from you. Without your mercy, we remain prisoners. Without your forgiveness, we remain in darkness. Without Jesus as our Lord, we remain your enemies. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that through him we can know salvation. We can know your forgiveness. He is the light of life, and only through him can we know friendship with you. We thank you that the Bible describes you, Lord, as our shepherd. You are the one who keeps watch over your people. You protect those who are yours. You provide for all our needs. You restore our souls. Thank you that you restore us, Lord. You make us more like Jesus as we seek to follow him, as we seek to obey him. You are very near to us every moment, Lord, renewing us and refreshing us, giving us strength and wisdom. All that we need, Lord, as we face the challenges of each day, we thank you for this, Lord. You are always faithful. You are always showing your love, and you never let us down. Father, thank you. Lord, we confess that we do not understand all your ways, but we walk in faith, Lord. We trust you. We know that we fall short of your standards, Father. We fail to obey you often. Even though we, we may strive to put into practice, Lord, what you teach us, we often fail. So, Lord, we come asking for your forgiveness. And we do this, Lord, knowing that when we repent of our sin, when we confess it, 
you do forgive us, Lord. And Father, we know that it is your desire to mold us and to make us more like your son. We pray, Lord, that you would help us as we seek to follow him. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Boys and girls, would you like to come up to the front? Everybody okay? Everybody good? Yeah? Fantastic. Okay, this morning I'm going to think about some things. I want you to think about what these things might do or what their purpose is, okay? We're going to think about what these things might do or what their purpose is. First thing we're going to think about is a plane, all right? A plane, an aeroplane. Thinking about what an aeroplane does. Now, let's think about this. Is the purpose of an aeroplane to go down a runway? Is that what an aeroplane's for? To go down the runway? No. Is the purpose of an aeroplane to sit at the airport, look nice? No? No? Okay. What's the purpose of a plane then? What does a plane do? Yeah? Fly. 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 Gets people. Yeah, fly. In a word, we could say fly, couldn't we? That's the purpose of an airplane. That's what a plane does, isn't it? There's a clue in the title, isn't it? Because it's called an aeroplane, isn't it? Aero. Air. Goes in the air. Flies. There's a clue in the, in the title, isn't there? Okay, let's think about the next thing. The next thing I have is a sailing boat. Sailing boat. Now, is a sailing boat, what does it do? Is its job to sit in the harbor and look nice? No. Is its job to float? Well, it does float, but I don't think that's its main job. It does float. Yeah, what's, what's, what's a sailing boat? What's the main thing a sailing boat does? Anybody over here? Yeah? Hmm? It can't, well, a fishing boat would do that, but a sailing boat... No, I'm thinking a sailing boat. Not a bad answer, though. Yeah. Sail. Yeah, a sailing boat seals. There's a clue in the title, isn't there? Sailing boat seals. Brilliant. Okay. Right, let's think about a footballer now. What does a footballer do? Is a footballer's job to juggle the ball up and down on his feet and look cool? No. Uh, does a footballer's job to go... Use your foot. Okay, that's not a bad answer. Footballer uses his foot. Is a footballer's job to go training on a Wednesday night? No footballer does that, but that's not the main thing a footballer does. What's the main thing a footballer does? Plays football. Absolutely. There's a clue in the title, isn't there? Footballer plays football. Last one. Last one. Go-kart. What does a go-kart do? What does a go-kart do, yeah? Um, it goes. It goes. Yeah, it goes fast. It's a clue in the title, isn't there? It's not a go-kart if it doesn't go. Sure it's not. Yeah? Go-kart goes. All right. Christian. What does a Christian do? What does a Christian do? It's anybody else? Anybody else? You, you, know, you all know the answer. Yeah? What does a Christian do? Yeah? Christian Praise. That's something a Christian does. Not maybe the main thing, but one thing. Yes? Yes? Believes in God, good answer, but maybe just not the one I'm looking for. Hmm? Worship. Worship God. Okay, but here's a clue. Remember, clues in the title. Yeah, yeah. Follow Christ. That's a good answer. Christian follows Christ. How does a Christian follow Christ? Read the Bible, yeah. We try and be like him, don't we? We try and do what he says. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you could say impress him. We're trying to do what he says. We're trying to be like him. It's a clue in the title. The word Christian literally means little Christ. Yeah? So it means we're to be a bit like Jesus. Yeah? We're to be like Jesus. That's what we try and do as Christians. So in doing that, we have to obey Jesus, don't we? When we read in the Bible things that Jesus tells us to do, we try and do them. Yeah, that's what a Christian does. Not always easy. Not always easy. But that's what we're called to do. Let me read you a verse. Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. So a Christian tries to live like Jesus. That's what a Christian does. Yeah? Follow Jesus and do as he says. All right? Not always easy, but that's what we do our very best to do. Do we always get that right? No. We often get it wrong. But we keep trying. 
God helps us, doesn't he? As we try and live like Jesus and as Jesus wants us to. And we get more and more like Jesus the more we try. Yeah? Because God helps us. So, a Christian tries to live like Jesus, follow Jesus. We'll pray because God, we need God's help, don't we, to do that? We're going to pray and ask God to help us as we try to live like Jesus. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you sent him for us. We thank you that when we believe in him, we have eternal life. But Lord, we know that Christians try to live like him. So I pray for all the boys and girls. You'd help them, and for the grown-ups too, to be able to strive to live like Jesus, to, to do their very best to do that. And Lord, we know that you will help us as we try and do this. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, brilliant. You want to take your seats again? We're going to sing. We're going to sing, Jesus bids us shine. offering will be received. Thank you that you give us the means that we can bring gifts for your work and for your kingdom. Father, bless what we have brought, Lord. We pray that you would use it for your glory and for your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I could just welcome the young people back in from Bible class uh, and just to again announce youth fellowships on this evening, uh, 7 p.m. in the Scott Rooms for, uh, for all the young people. Our youth matters uh, issue today is abortion. Now, abortion's a difficult issue. Uh, I think a lot of strong feelings on, on both sides of the debate. 
Uh, last week we thought about human rights, how all human life is precious. Every human is made in the image of God, and because of this, Christians predominantly, I think, believe that unborn babies are, are precious too. But many today would argue that women ha have the right to end the life of their unborn babies if they choose to. This point of view is known as pro-choice. Pro-choice. And those of this view would argue that raising children is hard. It's disruptive to a woman's life. And that women have the right to choose to do what they want with their own bodies. Now, I think most of us would agree that women do have a right to make choices regarding and relating to their own bodies. But also women can find themselves in circumstances where having a baby would be extremely challenging and difficult. However, when the, these choices impact the life of others, there surely must be limits on our freedom. Now, at the heart of the abortion debate is whether an unborn baby is a human person or not. A human person whose rights should also be taken into account, as well as those of the mother. Now, Christians, I think, would largely say, yes, unborn babies are human beings. They are made in the image of God, and their lives are precious. Now, some would argue that in the early stages of pregnancy, there isn't a baby. It's just the ball of cells. But if we examine the process of embryo development, there is no clear point, cutoff point, if you like, where we can say, now we have a little human. Some would argue that being against abortion or pro-life means not caring about pregnant mothers. Women with unplanned pregnancies need a great deal of care. But the answer isn't necessarily having an abortion, which actually can have long-lasting mental health consequences for the mother herself. Now, Christians would, for the most part, argue that both lives matter. Both lives matter, both the life of the mother and the life of the unborn child. But it's a difficult issue. It's a difficult issue. We come now to our prayers for others. Let's pray. Father, we again thank you that you are God who loves his children immeasurably. Your care for all is great. Father, that today we want to focus our prayers around families. Father, you bless us all with, with families of one kind or another. Father, we want to pray relating to parents, firstly, Lord. Father, you have blessed us all with parents, Lord. They may be living now or not, but we want to thank you for them either way, Lord, for the blessing they were or are to us. Father, thank you for the parents you blessed us with, the people they are or were. Father, you give us, many of us, brothers and sisters, and we thank you for them, Lord. You give us cousins and wider families as well, Lord. We thank you for those families you've placed us in, the people you've put us in loving relationships with. Father, we thank you for our children and our grandchildren as well. And we pray for them, Lord, in a world which is increasingly challenging to grow up in. We pray you would keep them safe, Lord, that they would know your care, that they would know that they are loved by you, and that they would walk with you, Lord, knowing you with them in their lives through Christ. Father, we know that sometimes families can be difficult places to be. Sometimes family relationships break down. We pray for our families, Lord, just that people could get on, people could love each other, People could respect each other, Lord, and forgive one another when, when there is need to. We pray for, that our families would be loving each other, Lord. Father, we want to, at this time, just remember those who are grieving, those who have lost loved ones over these last weeks or months even, Lord. Be near to them. Be, be their comfort. Lord, we continue to remember those who are unwell in, in any way, Lord. Those in hospital, those receiving ongoing treatment, Lord. Hold them tightly, Lord. May they know your encouragement and your peace. Father, in whatever struggles are been faced by those that we know and love, help them with them, Lord. 
May they know your strength. May they know your enabling, Lord, in difficult times. Father, we thank you for the, bre- the prayer that Jesus taught us, uh, and we say it now together. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before we come to think about God's word, we're going to sing again. We're going to sing, How Lovely Is Your Dwelling Place. You have no doubt heard the expression, life is for living. Life is for living. It simply means make the best of your life. Don't waste it. Each moment is precious. The time you have, it's limited. The time you have is the time you have. Use it well. Life is for living. It's about living well. Now, some authors associate living well with finding your purpose. Once you find your purpose, then you're able to live well. Finding a sense of purpose helps you live and live well. Now Mark Twain wrote, 
the most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you discover the reason why. Equally, we could say that the Christian life is for Christian living. The Christian life is for Christian living. As Christians, when we believe in Jesus as our Savior, we're given this gift of life, the promise of eternal life. We're given new life in that God's Spirit comes and dwells within us. Now, this life is described as Jesus by, by Jesus as abundant life, abundant life. But this gift of life is to be lived. It's to be lived out in our lives. The Christian life is for Christian living. To have the best possible life, Christian life that is, we need to be attentive to God's directions as to how to live. If we want to live out the Christian life well, then we need to keep consulting the manual. We need to keep putting it into practice. Now, I know some people perhaps think of the Bible as a list of rules or a list of do's and don'ts. And that's one way of looking at it. And yes, the Bible does contain rules. It does contain do's and don'ts. Uh, we had some do's and don'ts in the passage that I read. But you know, do's and don'ts are very useful. For example, a sign saying, don't cross this field, bull. That's a useful sign, isn't it? I'd rather have that sign than get halfway across the field and find out. Do's and don'ts can be very helpful. But the Bible, I think, can also be thought of as the handbook of life. The handbook of life. It points us both to the way of life through Jesus. And it sets out instructions for daily life. You might call them steps to success. Steps to living out the Christian life successfully. Steps to living as God would want us to live. Living the Christian life involves reading and applying the Bible to our lives in an ongoing way. Now it's clear from what we read earlier that there were a significant number of Christians in Ephesus not living out their Christian faith, not living a Christian life. Because Paul tells them that in verse 17, that they must no longer live as the Gentiles or the heathens live. Because their thinking was wrong, their minds were darkened, darkened, they were ignorant and they were stubborn. They'd lost all shame. They were doing all sorts of indecent things simply to indulge themselves, simply for their own pleasure. And they had a constant desire or, or lust for more. So it seems, reading between the lines, they were sleeping with whoever they liked, regularly drinking to excess, wanting more and more to do things like this. You know, in some senses, the world perhaps hasn't changed that much. People can tend to look for pleasure and satisfaction in ways which may, on the face of it, seem good. However, we often find these ways are not God's ways, and they're actually not good. Now, the Bible speaks out against things like sex outside of marriage, drunkenness, so we see Christians, or at least those who claim to be Christians, not living the Christian life. And I would say that we all come across people who proclaim to be Christians, but what they do and say would suggest something different. As humans, we like instant gratification. We can simply choose to indulge in whatever gives us that instant hit of pleasure without thinking too much about the long-term consequences. We can ignore God's ways with the assumption that we will enjoy ourselves more if we just follow the ways of the world. But this is a false assumption. The ways of the world, yes, give us a quick hit, if you like. They give us a certain amount of pleasure, but it's not lasting. It's gone like that, blink of an eye. And then we want more, don't we? more, whatever it is, more alcohol, more drugs, whatever it may be. We look for more of it to meet that perceived need or desire that we have for, for enjoyment. But often the things that we're looking to 
end up being destructive, cause us real harm in the long term. I think there's often an assumption that being a Christian just means you can't do a lot of the things that are just really enjoyable. But again, that's a false assumption because these things only give momentary and fleeting contentment. The world puts in front of us many things that seem good, but ultimately are not. And we could compare it, I guess, to Satan putting the apple or the fruit before Eve. Seemed good to eat it, but God had said, no, don't. It wasn't good for her to eat that. There is a much greater contentment and joy that builds as we seek God, as we strive to follow his ways, as we get to know him, as we grow in that relationship with him. After writing about the way that the Gentiles were living and telling them that the Christians shouldn't live like this, Paul writes in verse 20, you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Now, what does Paul mean by this? Well, one of Jesus' central messages was, repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. <clears throat> now, repent means to confess before God the things we've done wrong. Turn away from anything in our lives that is ungodly. To turn away from anything that God says is wrong. To turn away from sin on one hand, and the other turn to God. <clears throat> something we do when we first become a Christian, we repent. But it's also something we need to keep on doing on an ongoing basis because we sin every day, especially in our thoughts. As Christians, one of our priorities is to seek to be increasingly aware of the sin within us, especially that habitual sin, the habits that we have, which in many ways we don't want to see because they're things that are wrong. It's hard to see the things within us that are wrong. It's hard to see these things in us that aren't good. And it also can be a challenge to change them. It can also, it can just seem easier, I think, not to examine ourselves at all. But then we just remain unchanged, don't we, if that's the case. We're held down and we're held back by the sin, all that is wrong within us. In verse 22, we are instructed to put off the old self. This involves everything about us that we know is wrong in terms of our thoughts, our, our words, our actions. We are to strive to be aware of all that is within us that is ungodly in terms of our attitudes and our habits and to do all that we can to change with God's help. Putting off the old self <coughs> involves prayer, asking God to show us, show us those things that we need to change, the things that need to be changed and asking for his wisdom, his strength, and his enabling to do this. We're told to put off falsehood. Don't tell lies. Don't even listen to them. Don't let the sun go down while they're still angry. In fact, we're told to get rid of all anger, bitterness, rage, brawling, slander, and malice. If we do get angry with someone, we need to seek reconciliation. If we don't do this, we are told that we give the devil a foothold. Now this means if we continually keep saying or doing the wrong thing, these become habits. It becomes who we are. The devil gains a foothold because then we give in so much more easily as time goes on, doing the wrong things more and more. The devil is winning if this is the case. Now we see throughout the Bible that the devil is not a fictional character, but real. The ways in which Satan tempts us are real. Satan puts thoughts into our mind. He twists things. He tells us half-truths to get us to say things and do things that are simply wrong. We need to be alert to this. The more we give in to him, the more he has a hold on us. We don't want to give the devil a foothold. But of course, been a Christian, in terms of how we live our lives, isn't just a case of what we need to throw off or stop doing or saying or thinking. It's also a case of what we need to start doing or saying or thinking. 
things that we haven't before been doing. Put on the new self, we are told. Put on the new self. Think, speak, and act in ways that are good, ways that are godly. Verse 29, speak in ways that build people up. In other words, encourage people. Encourage them in faith. Encourage them in their Christian walk. People like to be encouraged. We're instructed in verse 32 to be kind and compassionate to one another and to forgive one another in Christ as Christ forgave us. Now, Christ in Christ we're forgiven everything. So we're called to forgive everything. Verse 30 tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And what does this mean? Well, it means don't cause God sorrow by continually doing what you know you shouldn't or by not living as you know you should. This grieves God. The Christian life involves Christian living. Now, what motivates us as we seek to live the Christian life? Well, it's seeing that there is a God who loves us, whose love is deeper and greater than perhaps we might ever know. The God who loves us, our motivation is the Savior who sacrificed his life for us, gave everything for us, died in our place, taking the awful consequences for our sin. Our motivation is Jesus, who rose again that we could be invited to know eternal life. When we see what sort of God it is who gives us these instructions, then we want to live the way that he tells us to. Because we know that anything he instructs us to do, it's for us, it's for our good, for our greater good, it's for our benefit. It's to enable him to bless us. Another important point to make, perhaps an obvious point, living the Christian life, it's a process. We obviously don't go from living a totally ungodly life one day to living a totally good Christian godly life overnight. As we strive in an ongoing way to live as God wants us to, then we have more and more success. And with God's help and enabling, we are changed over time. It's a process that goes on right throughout our life. We can only succeed in living a Christian life if we are striving to get to know God, to know him better seeking to build a deepening relationship with him through drawing near to him, taking time each day to be still, to read his word a little, to pray a little, to spend some time with him. These times are meeting with God. Christian living goes hand in hand with getting to know God better. If we're trying to live a Christian life without doing this each day, it's nearly impossible nearly impossible, very difficult indeed, to live in the way that God calls us to if we're not seeking to get to know him. Because in getting to know God, we grow in faith. And living a Christian life is really a response to God. It's a response to his love for us. As our relationship with him deepens, our hearts are changed. Our desire grows to live in a way that pleases him. Our motivation grows. At the beginning, we thought about the whole idea that life is for living. And that finding our purpose can help us or enable us to live well. Now, the same could be said about the Christian life. We only really start to live the Christian life when we find our purpose. God designed you and created you to know him. God designed you and created you to know him. To know him now and to know him eternally through Christ. True joy and true, and true peace are only found through knowing him. The desire and the ability to live a Christian life flows from knowing him. The purpose God made you and me for was to know him and to, as a result, live for him. The Christian life is for Christian living. God calls us, his children, to live the Christian life. Let's take a moment to be still, just to reflect on God's word.
Loving Father, we thank you that it is your desire that we come to know you. And as we come to know you, that we can live more and more for you. So Father, we pray for your help as we seek to live the Christian life. Lord, we know it's not always easy. We know often we get it wrong. Perhaps even we could say, Father, there's times we just don't even try. Forgive us for this. Father, help us as we grasp how much we are loved and how much Jesus has done for us. Help us to live more and more for you, the life you desire. Help us to follow the guidance that you give us, the instructions that you give us for our benefit and for our good. Help us as we seek just to apply your word to our lives each day, Lord, and to live, to live for you and to be more and more like Christ as we do. We pray this in his name. Amen. We close the service as we stand and sing, when we walk with the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore. Amen.